This episode is brought to you by Audible. This is Republican State Senator Doug Mastriano. He's the Republican who's ahead in the polls for governor. Earlier this year, Democrat Josh Shapiro spent $840,000 on this ad for far-right Republican candidate Doug Mastriano. He wants to end vote by mail, and he led the fight to audit the 2020 election. In June, the Democratic Colorado PAC funded this ad for far-right candidate Ron Hanks. And you better believe that back in May, the Democratic Governors Association ran this ad for the far-right Republican Darren Bailey. Before I explain what's going on, look at this ad. This one was funded by a Nancy Pelosi PAC in California. Try to remember that while you're watching it, because this is what these ads look like in practice. Same label, so Republicans gotta check the ingredients. David Valadeo claims he's Republican. Yet, David Valadeo voted to impeach President Trump. Yeah, Valadeo voted to impeach Trump. And Republican Chris Matisse, a true conservative, 100% pro-Trump and proud. Pro-Trump Republican Chris Matisse, military veteran, local businessman. Or politician David Valadeo who voted to impeach Trump. Republicans, it's time to decide. House Majority PAC is responsible for the content of this ad. All these ads are essentially the same. They're all targeted at a conservative audience, and they all paint the candidates in the same way. As the most conservative candidate that's closest to Trump. In other words, as the Republican voter's best choice. What the f*** is going on? In simple terms, the Democratic Party is literally funding far-right politicians. Not just the opposition, not just any Republican, but the extreme wing of the GOP. If you're new here, allow me to be the first to welcome you to the shining city on a hill and beacon of democracy that is the US. Don't mind the fire. These ads are really, really weird. Not just because one party is funding another, that's already insane. It's the specific kinds of candidates being funded. The kind of candidates Democrats say they hate. If you've been following them for a while, you might remember this clip of Joe Biden talking about how America needed a strong and principled Republican party. We need a Republican Party. We need an opposition that's principled and strong. And it's not just Joe. Nancy Pelosi said the same thing about needing a strong Republican Party earlier this year. She told the press that she was really bummed about the GOP being, quote, hijacked by extremists. But less than four months later, she was the one paying for the hijackers' plane tickets. At first, this might look like hypocrisy. Democrats say they want a moderate opposition, but they fund the far right. They say one thing, do another, we the public catch them in a lie, and bim bam boom, democracy is saved and we can all go home. But that's actually not what's happening. There is nothing hypocritical about Democrats saying they want a moderate opposition and then funding a far right challenger. That's because these are actually two sides of the same political strategy coin. A strategy that, as we'll see, not only reveals the class interest of the Democratic Party, but shows us one of the mechanical ways our capitalist society is decaying into fascism. If that sounds dramatic, just wait. I promise you it's not. But let's go from the beginning and start by explaining why Democrats are funding these candidates in the first place. The first thing to know is that midterms are coming up and the Democrats are terrified. Biden's numbers are in the trash and all reliable, funding a war in a foreign country isn't working quite as well as it usually does. There is little hope that Democrats will get a majority again. So they need a way to tilt the odds in their favor. And they've figured out how. Democrats are hoping that by making a bunch of far-right nutjobs win GOP primaries, two things will happen in general elections. One, moderate Republicans will be outraged and vote for a more centrist blue candidate. And two, solidly left-wing voters will also be outraged and vote for the lesser of two evils out of necessity. And the problem is that this strategy has worked for them before. In 2012, another Democrat, Claire McCaskill, spent $1.7 million on ads for the ultra-conservative Todd Akin, more than Akin spent himself. The result? Akin got a boost in the polls as soon as the ads started running, won the GOP primary, and then lost against McCaskill in the general election. This wasn't an accident, and it wasn't even a secret. McCaskill herself said, there were three viable candidates, and Todd Akin was kind of the weirdest one. I knew he might say some weird things if he were nominated. And he had less money, so we took a poll and figured out what Republican voters would really like about him. She even went on to write this article about it. Democrats fund these campaigns because they win when their opposition are far-right weirdos. Except when they don't. 
funding a far-right candidate and saying they want a moderate opposition are two ways for the Democrats to do the same thing, to position the Democratic Party as the only reasonable political choice. By saying that the Republicans are being hijacked by extremists and then actively funding that hijacking, the Democrats are creating an image of themselves as the only remaining bastion of democracy, the only way to vote that won't actively tear the country down. At least until the Republicans go, quote unquote, back to normal, which Democrats know will never happen. Democrats are reliant on the right being represented by the worst guy imaginable, and will actively work to make that the case either, as we see here, with direct funding, or more commonly, by pitting themselves only against candidates like Trump. Clinton never campaigned against guys like Jeb Bush. Her opponent was only whoever was the farthest to the right and could make her supporters most upset. She drummed up a radical opposition because it's a much safer strategy than running against someone who shared a lot of her ideas. But this strategy has a couple different outcomes. It might, as Democrats hope, bring some moderate Republicans to their side and get more blue voters out to the polls. Maybe. But it might completely backfire and their funding will just have gotten more far-right wackos into politics. No one can know for sure what's going to happen come election time. What is guaranteed, though, is that this lesser of two evil strategy allows the Democrats to move further right and still get votes from left-wing voters. And it actively promotes fascism. More ad spots featuring quasi-fascist politicians, brandishing fascist slogans, and actively supporting the president who, so far, has embodied fascism the most, all promote the popularity of fascism in the US. That is undeniable. At the end of the day, fascism is getting more airtime, convincing more conservatives, and the Democrats are absolutely to blame. With not the best odds of winning, and with the knowledge that this strategy promotes ultra-conservative politics in America, why would the Democrats run these ads? After all, Democrats aren't fascists, they're liberals. There is a difference. Why are they going with a risky strategy that, even in its best case scenario, actively makes society worse? There are two explanations. One, mechanical, at the party level. This strategy is a direct product of the way the Democratic Party is organized. Another, at the societal level. This strategy is the product of how our entire economy is organized. Let's start with that second one. You may have heard the phrase, fascism is capitalism in decay. That sentence is used to say that, as capitalism starts failing the people it usually benefits, starts decaying, it concedes strategic ground to fascism in order to survive. It's an idea that gained traction in the 20th century when socialists realized that capitalism wasn't being replaced by socialism like they expected. World War I and the Great Depression, brought on by a global economic crash, didn't lead to socialism replacing capitalism's global hegemony. Instead, reactionary movements started popping up everywhere, most notably in Germany and Italy. Capitalism hadn't been replaced by socialism, it had adapted into something new, fascism a political economic system that didn't look like capitalism, and that often even gave up on, quote, free markets, but that preserved the private ownership and profits of the capitalist class. The same people were on top, but things looked a little different. Here's how socialists explain something like this happening. As capital concentrates into fewer and more powerful monopolies, as the rate of profit falls, as more and more people are kicked into poverty and those remaining in the workforce are increasingly overworked, the conditions that produce fascism begin to appear. Monopoly capitalism, the inevitable outcome of winner-take-all competition, leads to economic stagnation and crashes. The first victims of this stagnation and these crashes are of course the working class, as we saw in the Great Depression, 2008, and with the COVID recession. Millions of people are suddenly thrust into poverty and can't make ends meet. The thing is that within this context, governments are no longer able to rule as they usually do they have to resort to more direct violence to keep their hold on power. People's demands are no longer brushed away by politicians in assemblies. They're actively resisted with cops on the street. For example, when people start demanding to defund the police or for a price freeze on basic necessities. Political stagnation is just no longer an option for capitalist governments now that tens of millions of people's immediate needs aren't being met. So to preserve that political gridlock that is so stable and profitable, governments get used to scaling up the violence. But when people need to vote you in to govern, governments need to find a justification for this sudden growth in state violence. And this is where fascism comes in. Fascists usually explain the decay of capitalism not by the inherent flaws of the system, but by its corruption by a small minority. 
a minority usually separated out from the rest of society along arbitrary lines, like race, ethnicity, or place of birth. Fascists assert that it is these minorities, not the natural tendency for wealth to accumulate into fewer hands under capitalism, that has pushed the masses into misery, and therefore, that state violence is legitimate in order to punish those minorities and anyone who defends them or advocates for systemic change. After all, the system is perfect. It's those people that are the problem. Fascists explain away the failure of the system and its sudden uptick in violence with scapegoating. It's as simple as that. Because this kind of narrative is beneficial to established capitalist governments, this struggle for power gets mirrored at the national level. Governments that benefit from capitalism would rather concede to fascism and keep their benefits, rather than allow for socialism to grow in popularity and upset their power and private interests. This theory of fascism is how socialists explain the 20th century. But practically speaking, how does this concession to fascism actually happen? What exactly is it that has to take place for fascism to gain this kind of place in society and government? This is where the Democratic Party comes in. You probably know that another idea, socialism, has gained traction these past few years. Around 70% of millennials and Gen Z say they are somewhat or extremely likely to vote for a socialist. And nearly a quarter of them believe society would be better if all private property was abolished. Faced with this demographic information, the Democrats have two choices. Either they adopt socialist policies, or they win elections. The thing is, they can't do both. Not at a party-wide level. That's because the Democrats aren't just contending with the public's pressure when they run for office. While the public may want socialism, more than ever before, not every Democrat can adopt socialist rhetoric and policies into their program. That's because at the core of every Democrat's strategy is the question of how do you get funding? Average people don't contribute that much to political campaigns. And very wealthy people will not fund a party with policies that threaten their profits. They just won't. Not if that threat starts becoming real. A few socialists in the party is okay, but a party that embraces socialism can't afford to run nearly as many ads. That means that Democrats who support socialist policies will have to fight an upstream battle. They'll need to fundraise at a much more grassroots level. They'll have to contend with constant villainization in media institutions owned and operated by some of the wealthiest people on Earth. And they will constantly deal with the pressure of simply existing within a party that is not hospitable to socialist ideas. That doesn't necessarily mean they can't succeed, it just means it's the hardest path to success. With these kinds of challenges, many more Democrats will take the easy win of running against a far-right opponent to try to capture centrist voters. Fascism grows just because it's easier. This kind of system doesn't need anyone to be evil. It doesn't need anyone to lie, nobody needs to be actively dishonest. Enough people just need to follow the path of least resistance. It is in the material interest of Democrats to not concede any more ground to socialism than is absolutely necessary for their survival. And by comparison, it's much easier to fund and then run against the far right. The more their platform is influenced by the anti-capitalist left, the more likely they are to lose elections. So without trying to make fascism more popular, just by being okay with it happening to win elections, fascism gains traction in our society. This is not the only way fascism takes over, but man is it an effective one. That is why I constantly talk about alternative networks of power on this channel. Why I focus so much on the institutions of our government and how they're constructed. Why I keep telling you to organize, unionize, participate in mutual aid, and study up and disseminate information on alternatives to the capitalist economic model. The natural tendency of our elected institutions and political parties is to prioritize capitalism even when it fails most people and starts relying on fascism to survive. Our institutions were built with preserving capitalism in mind, not to be accurate reflections of the public's will, especially when the public turns to socialism. Without building institutions that can resist this natural tendency, this country will comfortably slide into fascism. We can and we must put a stop to it. The US is kind of in a boiling frog scenario. We're not just gonna wake up one day and someone will have flipped the fascism switch. It's a process, and we're already pretty far along. It is so important that we come to terms with that fact and act accordingly. I try my best to learn and understand as much as I can so I can share with others. And one way I like to do that is by listening to audiobooks. I travel a lot for work, so I have plenty of time to sit on planes and listen to fascinating audiobooks on Audible. One great one that I recently listened to is Michael Parenti's Black Shirts and Reds. 
It is hands down one of the best works I've found that really explains what fascism is about and how it relates to capitalism. If you like to learn as much as I do, getting to pick a free audiobook every month is pretty nice. I don't think I can accurately convey how much I love Audible. I struggle to sit down and read a book, but with Audible, I can get through all the titles I've wanted to, all while running errands, or commuting, or traveling for work. It's completely changed how I learn. If you enjoyed this week's video, I highly recommend you check out Black Shirts and Reds on Audible. It's a fantastic listen. So, if you want to help support my channel so I can produce more content like this, visit audible.com slash secondthought, or text secondthought, one word, to 500-500. Sign up today and get your first month absolutely free. It really does help support me and my channel. Get started by following the link below, or by texting secondthought to 500-500. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous content by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.